My name is Lise Grande, and I'm the head of the United States Institute of Peace. It was established by the U.S. Congress in 1984 as a national nonpartisan public institution focused on helping to prevent and mitigate violent conflict abroad. We're very pleased to welcome everyone to today's discussion on transnational crime in Southeast Asia, and most particularly to welcome Cindy Dyer, fellow Texan and the ambassador at large, to monitor and combat trafficking in persons. What we hope to do today is to learn more about what's going on with transnational crime in Southeast Asia, one of the epicenters for criminal networks in the world. We want to learn more about what the risks are to people in the region and ordinary citizens here in the U.S. because of this crime, and how we can work better together to counter this phenomenon more effectively. Transnational crime, as I think we all know, is emerging as a major threat to regional and global security. It threatens international trade and governance. It puts millions of hardworking, vulnerable people at very grave risk. And it's deeply worrying that there is increasing evidence that many of these criminal networks and enterprises are affiliated with one of our competitors, our sometime adversary, with China. Last month, Ambassador Dyer's office released the 2023 report on human trafficking. It's a deeply disturbing report that describes new trends in transnational crime in Southeast Asia, including the, grow, the growing number of China-affiliated networks that use sophisticated technology to traffic victims into compounds where they are forced to defraud and trap people into the unregulated world of crypto scams and schemes. USIP as an institute first began investigating these trends under Jason Tower in Myanmar two years before the 2021 military coup. Since then, these networks have become entrenched in several Mekong countries, aided by the junta. No Asian country is unaffected by this crisis. And the tentacles of these criminal enterprises have reached as far as Nigeria, Brazil, and the US. This is an important topic, and we look forward to an interesting discussion with leading experts. Ambassador, may we invite you to the floor. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, and thank you especially to Lise Grande, my fellow Texan, and to USIP for the kind invitation to be here today. I am happy to participate in this event to raise public awareness of cyber-enabled transnational crime in Southeast Asia. And I want to recognize the outstanding work that USIP has done in this area. Cyber-enabled human trafficking in particular is an issue that has been a focus of my office and one that needs broader public awareness in countries around the world. As ambassador at large, I am honored to lead the State Department's Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons, also known as the TIP Office. The TIP Office leads the State Department's global efforts to combat human trafficking, which includes both sex trafficking and forced labor, by objectively analyzing government efforts and identifying global trends, engaging in strategic bilateral and multilateral diplomacy with foreign government and counterparts, targeted foreign assistance to build the capacity of governments and civil society to combat trafficking, and advance the coordination of federal anti-trafficking policies across U.S. government agencies. The TIP office also produces, as Lise mentioned, the Department of State's Annual Trafficking in Persons Report, or the TIP Report, which examines government's efforts to meet the minimum standards included in the U.S. Trafficking Victims Protection Act to combat human trafficking across a 3P framework of protecting victims, prosecuting traffickers, and preventing this crime by dismantling the systems that make it easier for traffickers to operate. 
Now in its 23rd year, the report reflects the U.S. government's commitment to global leadership on this key human rights, law enforcement, and national security issue. On June 15th, Secretary Blinken released the 2023 TRIP report. One key takeaway from this year's report is that there were increases in global data points to include prosecutions, convictions, and victims identified as compared with the totals in the 2022 report. Globally, criminal prosecutions and convictions were higher in the years during and immediately after the pandemic, and victim identifications increased by nearly 25,000, although none were back to the pre-pandemic levels. Globally, efforts to, to prosecute and convict labor traffickers and identify labor trafficking victims were also notably higher than prior years, which we attribute both to ongoing improvements in government efforts in this area, as well as better government data collection and reporting. In the East Asian and Pacific region as a whole, there was an increase in the number of traffickers prosecuted, convictions of traffickers, and victims of trafficking identified. These data points documenting tangible government efforts at a time, at many times in partnership with NGOs, IOs, and other stakeholders are among the critical criteria used in TIP report country assessments. These increases are encouraging, but there remains much work to be done to address significant human trafficking problems in the region. There remain region-wide issues with labor trafficking among domestic workers, forced labor in the agricultural and fishing sectors, and official complicity in trafficking cr crimes, among other concerns. In addition, and importantly, this year's report also focused on the rapidly growing and troubling trend of forced labor and forced criminality in cyber scam operations. While the TIP office reported on the issue of forced labor in cyber scam operations previously, we saw a marked increase in this crime over the past year. It is most prevalent in, but not exclusive to, Southeast Asia. Traffickers have leveraged pandemic-related economic hardships, global youth unemployment, and international travel restrictions to exploit thousands of adults and children in a multi-billion dollar industry over the last two years, where these people, these victims, often respond to job offers for what they think is work in IT, casinos, or other seemingly legitimate businesses. However, once the individuals arrive at the job site, the scam operators force them to run internet scams directed at international targets and subject them to a wide range of abuses and violations, including withholding travel and identity documents, imposing arbitrary debt, restricting access to food, water, medicine, communications, and movement, and threatening and physically abusing them. The scam operations include quota-based fraudulent sales, illegal online gambling and investment schemes, and romance scams, in which the victim is forced to enter into a fake online relationship with and extract money from unsuspecting targets. Traffickers force the victims to work up to 15 hours a day and in some cases resell victims to other scam operations or subject them to sex trafficking if they do not agree to fraudulently recruit additional members or if the victims do not meet impossibly high revenue quotas. There are even reports of casino-based cyber scam operators brutally murdering workers who try to escape. In this year's report introduction, we outline a typical experience of a trafficking survivor who was 20 years old when traffickers recruited him from Central Asia to work in information technology in Southeast Asia.
Or after arriving there, traffickers took him to a different country along with other victims and forced him to work in an organized crime ring scamming people on the internet. When he requested to leave, the traffickers gave him a condition, pay $3,000 for his freedom or continue working in the cyber scam operation. He borrowed money from acquaintances and paid the traffickers so that he could travel to another country. He ultimately contacted an international organization in his home country and it helped him to safely return home. This example is far from unique and represents an outcome much better than the experience of many trafficking victims of forced labor in these operations who cannot escape and do not receive help. To date, individuals from 40 countries and areas, including the United States, have been identified as victims of forced labor in cyber, cyber scam operations. These include nationals of countries all over the world, including North America, Africa, Central Asia, and Europe, as well as East and Southeast Asia. Cyber scam operations, many, as Lise said, run by locally operating PRC national organized crime syndicates have been found in Burma, Cambodia, Laos, Malaysia, and the Philippines in Southeast Asia, and we continue to monitor for reports of new locations as operations spread. Unfortunately, trafficking survivors who escape with their lives are often met with administrative or criminal charges for immigration violations or forced criminality at home, in the countries and in areas in which they were exploited or in the countries to which they fled, rather than being identified as trafficking victims and having the opportunity to access and benefit from protection services. Some governments and authorities in the region have taken steps to assist victims and have begun to coordinate responses through the Bali process and ASEAN. Taiwan, for example, increased efforts to screen for victims in forced labor in cyber scam operations and provide immunity in cases of forced criminality. Laos cooperated with international authorities to recover Lao victims from the Golden Triangle Special Economic Zone in Bokeo, and Hong Kong created a web-based application for victims and family members to report cases of cyber scam operations and receive information. However, governments and authorities around the world need to increase efforts to train their diplomats and representatives law enforcement officers, and border and ju judicial officials on how to detect and assist in these cases domestically and abroad to ensure victims are identified and provided access to robust protection services rather than penalized solely for unlawful acts committed as a direct result of being trafficked. Governments and authorities should also increase awareness among vulnerable communities and collect and share widely available information on known fraudulent recruitment channels. And governments should investigate and prosecute the traffickers exploiting these victims. No government or authorities can do can do this alone. Governments and authorities around the world must foster, cooperate with, and enhance their support to a free and healthy civil society rather than restricting space for NGOs and complicating their ability to benefit from international donor activity. For the part of the U.S. government, we will continue to urge governments and authorities to proactively identify and assist victims and protect people from fraudulent recruitment schemes like these. And we will continue to raise awareness of this issue. We will continue to leverage and expand bilateral and multilateral diplomacy across the region to strengthen coordination in support of concrete solutions for victims of 
forced labor and forced criminality in cyber scam operations. We deeply appreciate the efforts of USIP and the other speakers in this event to make the public aware of this criminal activity affecting the peace and security of people all over the world. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today and I look forward to hearing and learning from the other experts gathered here. Is the microphone working? Yes, I can hear it. It is good. <clears throat> well, we're very privileged today to have with us some of the best experts from the Southeast Asia region in the development of the criminal networks in that area. <clears throat> um, let me just give you a, a brief, uh, <clears throat> a brief uh, bio on each of them. <clears throat> I have to wear my glasses. Um, Jacob, Jacob Sims in the middle is with the International Justice uh, Mission and he's a senior technical advisor on forced criminality spearheading IGM's global pursuit of accountability at the nexus of human trafficking and transnational organized crime. <clears throat> he was previously IJM's country director for Cambodia, mounting one of the earliest programmatic responses to the human trafficking epidemic emerging in scamming compounds in Cambodia. His analysis has been featured most recently in publications by UNODC, the UN Office of what? Drugs and Crime. Drugs and crime. <laughs> drug, traffic, drug trafficking. I deal with it all the time and I don't know what it means. Uh, U.S. Department of State, The Economist, The Guardian, LA Times, Al Jazeera, Sydney Morning Herald, and many others. And then we have Dr. Alvin Kamba at the end here. He's assistant professor at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver with a PhD in sociology from Johns Hopkins University. He is part of the Corbell School's Responsible Public Engagement Project, funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Um, <clears throat> he is also a faculty affiliate at the Center for International Environment and Resource Policy and the Climate Policy Lab, that's a long name, at Tufts University Fletcher School. His research has been awarded high honors for several academic networks, published in top development and political e economy journals, and incorporated in several widely circulated think tank policy papers on China's activities in Southeast Asia. He is frequently quoted in articles by top news outlets. With a focus on maritime Southeast Asia, Dr. Kamba explores themes such as inter-elite competition, institutional change, social conflicts, ecological ramifications, and growth strategies. <clears throat> Most recently, he has turned to Chinese illicit capital's relationship with transnational crime and the United Front's propaganda and disinformation strategies. And last but not least is our very own Jason Tower who's the head of the USIP uh, Myanmar program. He is our country director of, of the Burma program. With over 20 years of experience working on conflict and security issues in China and Southeast Asia. From 2009 to 17, he established uh, a Beijing office of the American Friends Service Committee and initiated programming across North and Southeast Asian, Asia on the impact of conflict the impact on conflict by cross-border investments, while also working extensively in Burma on peace and security issues. <clears throat> he received his undergraduate degree in international and economic studies from St. Louis University, and his graduate degree in his master's in political science from the University of Michigan. He's received a number of prestigious fellowships, and Jason is fluent in Mandarin Chinese which we depend on vitally in our program here. So I would like to turn, first of all, to um, 
to Jacob. You have been on the front lines of the development of this kind of trafficking and uh, scam operations in Cambodia. Can you tell us something about how it has developed in recent years? Because it's really exploded in the last couple of years. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor, honor to be here uh, with this uh, really excellent panel. So labor trafficking has been a major issue in Cambodia for a very, very long time. But it's also followed a fairly consistent pattern for a long time. Cambodians suffer from some of the lowest wages, worst economic opportunities, highest rates of landlessness and indebtedness anywhere in the region. And some combination of these factors have conspired for a very long time to, to push Cambodians into high-risk employment opportunities overseas. But what we've seen at the start of the pandemic, these very significant push factors were actually disrupted by the lockdowns, which impacted a lot of these industries. Uh, and we also saw new vulnerabilities arise with the beginning of the scamming industry. So um, almost overnight, using some of the mechanisms that Ambassador Dyer described, we started to see thousands, eventually tens of thousands, of foreign nationals coming to Cambodia, finding themselves in hotels, casinos, apartment complexes, and forced to conduct scams. Um, it, this is a, a massive, violent, unchecked criminal industry. And with the emergence of that industry, we've actually seen the entire paradigm for human trafficking in Cambodia, but not just Cambodia around the region, really turned on its head. And, and some of those shifts imply a very different response that is needed if we have any hope of protecting some of those people. And I've already alluded to those migration patterns have shifted, but we've also seen a huge shift in demographic as well. While human trafficking can impact anybody, the, the rural, uh, poorly educated, extremely impoverished within Cambodia where you're typical a victim of human trafficking. But today you're seeing uh, more urban, young, technologically savvy, highly educated, multilingual people also falling victim to this. And, and they're being exploited through different mechanisms as well. Um, you know, this is not typically your, your community-based and formal brokers that have dominated the trafficking space in Cambodia for a long time. These are more organized, sophisticated, transnational groups largely operating online over social media. So when you're developing an effective prevention campaign, your target population of interest has changed, your geographic coverage has expanded dramatically, and, and the channel that you're hoping to reach people has also changed. But the, there also have been significant shifts in how we need to protect people. So for example, embassies, as Ambassador Dyer alluded, play a vital role in every form of cross-border labor exploitation. But now you have large numbers of embassies from these sending countries that have never or at least very seldom dealt with citizens from their own countries getting caught up in a situation of human trafficking in a place like Cambodia. So we need to invest heavily in providing the resources and capacities to those embassies and other duty bearers that aren't used to dealing with this, these sorts of issues to respond effectively. I also say prosecution needs have changed. So this issue is far more transnational than anything the human trafficking community uh, has experienced in the past. And so you have broker networks in source countries. You have traffickers, complicit immigration officials in transit countries. And obviously, you have the compound owners, the operational masterminds, and their co-conspirators in the de destination countries like Cambodia, that to address an issue like this in Cambodia, all of those actors need criminal accountability. But this is also far more sophisticated. So the need for local and regional and international law enforcement collaboration uh, has never been greater. And, and then lastly, I'll say the human trafficking community in Cambodia needs a very different set of partners today. So the platforms of major social media companies and financial institutions and uh, telecoms providers are all being profoundly instrumentalized and are playing a significant role in facilitating the growth and, and continuation of this industry. And so those private sector actors are also going to need to be heavily engaged if we're going to hope to see uh, uh, anything like uh, an effective response. And I think my, my main points here just in closing are um, to, to respond to this in Cambodia is no longer a Cambodia 
centric response. It's not even a regional response. As Ambassador Dyer said, over 40, victim, uh, 40 countries where victims are coming from, but then this is a, a billions, if not tens of billions, large uh, industry that is impacting countries all over the world. And so you know, this, this industry is growing. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not going anywhere. And if we're going to have any hope at addressing it in a place like Cambodia, we're going to need a global response. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Burma, Cambodia, and Laos are the heart of the problem in mainland Southeast Asia, but there's also a lot of it in maritime Southeast Asia. Um, Dr. Kamba, can you tell us something about the, the um, patterns that we're seeing in, in maritime Southeast Asia? Well, uh, first, thank you very much for having me in this panel. It's an absolute honor to be here. So um, I'll answer this in uh, three different ways. I'll focus on the second answer mo much more. So I'll talk about the maritime Southeast Asian countries first. I'll talk about the Philippine case mostly, where I've done my research and where I'm from. And I'm going to talk about what has happened since the pandemic. Now, uh, generally speaking, maritime Southeast Asian states have better levels of governance, better uh, rule of law. Um, more stable democracies than like, than I would say like you know in many indicators than, than like most countries at least in like mainland Southeast Asia. Um, historically speaking, trafficking wasn't really a problem in these countries, with the exception of let's say Filipinos, Indonesians being trafficked in the Middle East and dealing with labor exploitation, etc. Now. Um, Given this difference, I, uh, when we think about like trafficking, it it goes through like you know sort of like maritime routes rather than like sort of, let's say land, land 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 borders and like people crossing from one area to another. So there are distinct barriers to let's say trafficking in this in this region. Now, for trafficking to happen in maritime Southeast Asia, governments have to be involved, and this is where I talk about the Philippine case much more. And this is where the Philippines is a good case, not of Filipinos being trafficked into these industries, but rather the Philippines became the home for Chinese uh, citizens being trafficked in online gambling scam hubs or online gambling centers back in 2016 during the time of Rodrigo Duterte. And I'll talk about this case as my, as my second point. Now, Online gambling has historically been uh, you know, an industry for the Philippines, earning you know, millions of dollars for the Philippine government. Since 2016, the industry exploded. We're talking about uh, $500 like, million dollars of tax access being paid to the Philippine government, more than 120 online gambling firms, largely coming from the Cayman Islands and um, you know, the British Virgin Islands, all these like, offshore financial centers going to the Philippines. And we're talking about 500,000 uh, Chinese citizens traffic and legal semi, legal semi legal status going into Metro Manila and working in these industries. And this, this was facilitated by none other than the former Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte. We all know him as a pro China like individual. He gave up the, South, the West Philippine Sea when he became president. That's not the only thing he did. One of the things he did when he became president as early as 2016 in October was to centralize online gambling under the Philippine uh, Amusement Gaming Corporation, which is the Philippine agency in charge of gambling. And what he did was he, he, he took the Philippine police and he uh, strong-armed the online gambling, uh, online gambling firms in the special economic zones under uh, which was controlled by um, Macauan uh, gambling, uh, gambling um, I don't know how to like, name him, gambling investor Jack Lam. And he took the police, he basically like cut down that particular like uh, this group and he and and so that, that's what he did with like one group of like online gambling firms. And the other online gambling firm, which is controlled by, um, this is a very Philippine-centric story, by Philippine uh, oligarch Roberto Ongpin, he, he did not renew the license of, of Roberto Ongpin's firms. And eventually, he sort of controlled and centralized online gambling uh, under his administration. And, and this, this, this in turn helped um, his uh, sponsor by the name of Michael Yang. This is all in public documents. Uh, the Philippine government is now looking for Michael Yang, so <laughs> there's like, um, there's, a, there's an issue there. Um, so online gambling became a thing in the Philippines. Criminality went up from uh, you know, sex work to drugs to uh, Chinese triads and mafias operating openly in Metro Manila. Uh, funny enough, the Chinese government actually demanded many of these people to be extradited back to China. And the Philippine government and the Duterte actually refused extraditing many of these people, which is a very inter interesting dynamic when we think about the relationship of China and transnational crime and the Philippine government. Now, fast forward in 2020, 2021, when the pandemic happened, um, China shut off its borders. La laborers could not get into the Philippines. Financial transfers became much more <laughs> difficult to do. And ma many of these firms left the Philippines and went to <laughs> Myanmar, went to Cambodia, and went to many of these places that uh, Jason and Jacob, of course, know better. And 
the tides have turned in the Philippine government right now. The Marcos administration is by and large against online gambling. And because, and because of because of that, there's public clamor right now to shut down online gambling in the Philippines, despite the supposed economic benefits it brings to the country. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Jason, the heart of the problem right now seems to be in Burma, Myanmar, particularly since the coup of 2021. It has really mushroomed in the lawless environment that now exists in the country. Can you tell us a bit about that and also um, you have been looking regionally and internationally at the development of this scamming. So we appreciate your thoughts on that as well. Thanks, thanks Priscilla. Yes, I'd agree uh, largely with that characterization that Myanmar has become an epicenter of this form of criminality that I believe already um, the, the earlier speakers and Ambassador Dyer have uh, laid out uh, uh, in terms of some of the very disturbing trends that we're seeing. Um, I wanted to highlight in terms of how we've gotten here uh, from Myanmar. Um, really two trends that we've seen that have been accelerated by the military coup. Um, one is that uh, all of the different forces within society that had been working to try to check the expansion of criminal activity. So for example, um, the NLD government prior to the coup had been looking at the formation of some of these large scale criminal enclaves on the Myanmar Thai border, which started to rise around 2017 as many of the Chinese criminal groups relocating from Cambodia or from the Philippines uh, started to target that uh, particular uh, area. The NLD government worked to crack down. It pushed back uh, when um, largely PRC-affiliated criminal groups tried to associate the criminal enclave that they were developing there to house illicit online gambling and other forms of scams, such as the pig butchering scams. Um, the NLD government, when they uh, saw these criminal actors start to tie the project to China's Belt and Road Initiative, when they saw state-owned enterprises being brought in to develop a lot of that infrastructure, they pushed back. And you saw the Chinese government actually have to take the step of disassociating themselves publicly with some of that criminal activity. And then you also saw the Myanmar military uh, be cornered into having to start cracking down on some of the criminal activity that was taking place there after the NLD formed a committee and worked on uh, trying to publicly uh, really embarrass and push the military to deal with um, a border guard force entity that was directly under its own command, which was one of the key enablers of the criminal activity there. Um, since the coup, what we've seen happen is all of those efforts to try to address the expansion of this crime basically be erased. Um, the political parties that were involved in um, pushing some of the efforts to crack down, their, their leadership has either been detained or brought underground. Um, you've seen um, the media space completely undermined in Burma with um, all of the free media that developed over the, the decade before the coup, either being pushed out of the country, forced to go underground, or being replaced by pro-military media, which of course is putting out very different messaging around uh, what is, is happening in country today. So uh, media access has more or less disappeared as a result of uh, the coup. Civil society has um, also been forced to either go underground, been detained, been undermined by um, the ongoing chaos that has ensued since the military coup as well. Um, but then other factors. Um, the Myanmar military has redeployed the country's police to crack down on and crush any form of, of opposition uh, across the country. You've seen um, many members of the police force actually um, defect, uh, go underground as well. So that what this has done is it's dismantled the, the police. Um, you've also seen the military uh, in terms of just the economic malaise that has followed uh, the coup um, with many of the um, legitimate business actors either exiting the country or stopping any plans to expand uh, any further economic uh, plans. It's uh, really opened its arms much more to these transnational criminal players who've developed um, rapidly growing influence across the country, um, causing many of these on 
enclaves that were initially on a trajectory of being cracked down on before the coup um, to be able to flourish. So looking at just some of the enclaves, uh, th these criminal enclaves where the online, the cyber scams, the pig butchering scams, um, the crypto based scams are, are taking place in the Thai Myanmar borderlands. Um, one zone in particular that we've done some research on called the KK zone had a roughly 25 structures where people were being um, in these forced labor forms of circumstances for to perpetrate these online crimes, which are now extending into the United States as well as a wide range of countries around the world. These 25 structures before the coup expanded to more than 76 structures after. Um, and this is a pattern that you've seen across all of the 35 plus enclaves that have formed in um, the country, most of them controlled by alliances between PRC affiliated crime groups and the military's own border guard forces um, that are now involved in perpetrating these crimes. Another very disturbing trend that you're seeing in Myanmar is the growing influence and power of this nexus between transnational crime groups, again most of these being PRC affiliated groups and militias more broadly. As once these um, malign actors have their tentacles into the country, they're even working to try to co-opt some of the pro-war democracy resistance actors and some of the um, uh, different resistance groups that are countering the military into their networks. So you've seen um, pro-democracy actors also some of their uh, areas targeted, um, some of their members uh, co-opted by these transnational criminal groups, bringing them also into um, this type of illicit activity and providing support and protection to the criminal networks. I think a case that really highlights just how deeply involved the Myanmar army is in all of this activity is the case of the Shui Koko Yatai New City Project, um, the proponent of which actually is now sitting in a prison in Thailand awaiting a decision as to which country he'll be extradited to because he managed to obtain uh, passports illegally from multiple countries, um, leaving us with a situation where law enforcement there in Thailand isn't sure exactly where he's he is Chinese. extradited. <laughs> he is Chinese, as the name would, uh, would, would indicate. But um, what happened around this case was the activity continued to spread at such an alarming pace that some of the resistance forces actually decided to initiate in April of this year a military operation against this particular enclave. Um, the Myanmar army, um, while you were seeing, you know, all sorts of uh, war fighting, other sorts of incidents across the country, immediately deployed uh, troops as well as overwhelming force to crush that effort to try to liberate this crime city in April of 2023. Um, that actually was successful, so the military uh, successfully fought off this effort to try to um, you know, forcibly go into this uh, criminal enclave where um, there are estimates that are uh, as as many as 10,000 people are now being held in these forms of forced labor circumstances. Um, so, you know, until now, um, these problems continue to proliferate. We're hearing um, about the expansion and construction of new zones um, all across the country. And while these problems, of course, do remain very serious in other Southeast Asian countries, I think Myanmar is the place where you're seeing more than anywhere else in the world um, the growing construction of new criminal enclaves specifically for this activity on an industrial scale really across the borderlands, but now also um, there's evidence of this happening even in the country's heartland in cities like Mandalay and in Yangon and uh, beyond. Um, the last thing, just tying this issue back to the theme of, of why this is so critical for uh, US security, Interpol uh, also put out uh, an orange alert earlier this year indicating that basically at any time, anywhere in the world, people could be um, victimized by both the forms of human trafficking that you're seeing um, now um, online, where you're having a lot of um, trafficking that is deploying these um, human resource scams or uh, other sorts of employment scams, um, often offering victims jobs in neighboring countries to Myanmar, or to Cambodia, or, or other places. Really anyone anywhere can be targeted by this activity, including in the United States. So um, this is an issue, I think as Ambassador Dwyer has, has already uh, uh, pointed out, that really warrants um, uh, strong US attention and leadership in trying to address.
Thank you very much. I could add one more detail to this, that these criminal networks that are being built in Burma and elsewhere are purpose-built. They're not just buildings that existed. They're purpose-built for, for what they're, they're being used for. And they're built like more and more like penal colonies, like prisons. They are the, the people inside are guarded by armed Chinese gangs. And in the, in the case of Burma, on the outside, the uh, <clears throat> security is provided by the, the border guard forces, by the Burmese bar border guard forces armed. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very, very serious um, criminal operation. And they're, they're using the, the, the latest uh, information and financial technology to run all of these scams. That's a very important element of the whole thing, very important. And, and tackling it is going to require getting at that, at the technology involved somehow, which is not easy. Thank you very much. Now, um, do we have questions coming in? I don't think it's for, yeah. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, so what steps have been taken to mitigate and combat cyber-enabled human trafficking, either domestically in each of the countries that you've discussed or in cooperation with regional neighbors such as Thailand? Um, and what impacts have they had, if any? Would you like to start us with that? Jacob? Sure, sure. Uh, just very briefly, thank you for that question. Um, I, sort of, there's a range of, of responses uh, from rescue efforts to prevention efforts, uh, as I alluded earlier, uh, now being targeted predominantly on social media. Um, new, new efforts to uh, reduce the, the level of law enforcement capacity gaps uh, that, are, that are largely addressing this, uh, and also uh, increasing numbers of international task forces with regional and international law enforcement, uh, bringing their capacity and their greater distance and independence to bear uh, um, on some of these issues. Um, I'd also like to point out um, that there have been significant efforts uh, to do robust raids and uh, pros criminal prosecutions in both the Philippines and Indonesia. Philippines actually on the compounds themselves. Uh, the Indonesian government has played a strong leadership role in trying to knock out some of these broker networks. Um, oftentimes their citizens are being exploited in other countries, uh, but the Indonesian government has taken some very strong steps to make sure that they are conducting robust victim screening processes and through those processes learning about and gathering evidence about these cases and working to, to disassimilate uh, some of these uh, broker networks. These are early stage efforts. Uh, much greater work is going to need to be done on prevention, protection, prosecution. Um, but the, those are some, I guess, some of the initial examples. Maybe just to add, I think there's also a very strong crackdown taking place cross-border in Thailand. So you've seen the um, Thai law enforcement uh, begin a series of campaigns uh, targeting a lot of the illicit business networks that are um, now also deeply embedded in Thailand, using Thailand as a bit of a um, landing ground um, to be able to operate the cross-border scams in, into Burma. They're trying to crack down on some of the trafficking that's taking place, although it's difficult because um, largely the victims are arriving in, in Thailand uh, legally, right? So many of them are being flown in um, on commercial flights, uh, escorted into VIP vans, and never, never heard again um, you know, after they, they do arrive in, in Thailand. But there's been some efforts in Thailand to try to crack down. Um, there's also been um, the involvement of some uh, multilateral uh, organizations, both with ASEAN, um, looking at some of these issues increasingly. Um, and then also the Bali process, which I think was mentioned earlier, um, mobilizing to uh, play a role in trying at least to get a better sense of just what the scale of this activity is and what some of the threats are. I think the point really to emphasize, though, is that the pace at which this activity is expanding uh, is much faster than the pace at which law enforcement is coming together and working on coordinating to devise an effective uh, response to a lot of the malign activity. Um, the other aspect of this being that many of the PRC-affiliated criminal networks have been also investing 
putting a lot of this illicit funding into cutting edge technologies, making it more and more difficult to both identify um, the, the, the criminals themselves, but also making their efforts to, to scam and to fraud uh, much more efficient. So I think that's another very disturbing trend, the use of artificial intelligence, the use of uh, blockchain, the use of uh, fintech and, and cryptocurrencies by a lot of these criminal groups. Oh, um, something quick on like the Philippine case. So one of the reasons why the new government became so adamant on criminalizing many of these firms or sort of like stopping the growth of like online gambling in the Philippines was because of public glamour. A lot of Filipinos simply experience like too, too many problems that emerge from on the online gambling sector. From, um, you, know, um, you know, Metro Manila is a city of 12 million people. Then you add like half a million like Chinese or people in Southeast Asia in, in the city. That, that creates like so many problems from transportation to drugs, crimes, etc. So at the end of the Duterte government, many Filipinos were so unhappy with like, online gambling. When Marcos came in, he knew he could take this as a political initiative to garner capital in, in terms of like stopping the growth of this industry at the same time, dis disassociating himself from the industry as a whole. I do want to highlight one more thing that many governments can do in, in, or, in, in order to like, stop these activities. I, I, and I, I believe that not all governments can do this, of course. I think better data gathering capacity is super important in terms of like trying to like, like understand these sectors and trying to like get at like you know sort of like what are like the what, what are the roots and what are like the what's a, what's a data point behind many of these like firms. So for instance, in the Philippine case, one of the things we did, me and my research assistants, was we gathered shareholder data on all the online gambling firms going into the Philippines, and we were able to locate the names of these people, who their partners are, how much money they've put in, etc. And because of that, we were able to sort of gather many of these firms. And we were able to like provide uh, data to the office of Senator Hontiveros in the Philippines, who actually like actively like work against this like the sectors. Uh, at the same time, we recognize the limits of our data gathering capacity. The Philippine government does not, uh, uh, unfortunately, does not list the shareholders of the British Virgin Islands and Cayman Islands, and we <laughs> it's anonymized. And if they were if they only required many of these like you know firms to sort of like uh, be transparent, then maybe we could have had, we could have had better data. Thank you. Next question. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Lee. I'm a filmmaker. And uh, um, I've listened that you, you highlighted many Chinese criminal syndicates and loosely Chinese government involvement. Um, I, I wonder, have you found any indication that the Chinese state security apparatus and its extensive network of agents and collaborators throughout all of Asia and the world are actually helping to coordinate, if not support, these criminal activities. And I postulate that if they are actually doing so, they do so for two reasons. One is to financial gains. Secondly, is to destabilize these emerging countries to stop it's democratic advancement. So just want to get your perspective on that. Thank you. Let me, let me start the response to that, because this, these are the kinds of questions that have also come to mind with me. Um, the connection, let's say the official connection between China and these operations is not clear. Uh, you can trace it back through multiple organizations in China that are that have official status, um, but that doesn't mean the government itself is involved. It does follow a pattern of the Belt and Road Initiative. Many of the countries that have become victims are on the Belt and Road um, uh, 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 pattern. Um, and the other thing you have to bear in mind is that the chief victim of this is Chinese. Most of the people that are being scammed from the beginning and even today are Chinese, whether they're in China or overseas Chinese. Because in Southeast Asia and, and even in most of the world, there's a large Chinese diaspora. And it preys on that diaspora as well. So it's all mixed in. It's, it's so intertwined that it would be difficult to separate them out and say, yes, this is cause and effect. 
Um, but yes, it does raise these kinds of questions. Jason, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, maybe I'll just uh, add a couple of, of points on this. That's a really important question, I think. Um, first of all, I think it's important to recognize how many of these transnational syndicates got to Southeast Asia in the first place, right? I mean, Chinese uh, law enforcement started cracking down on criminal actors domestically, and they started shifting overseas, shifting their operations overseas. Once there, of course, they began to co-opt elites across the region, building protection in some of the countries that we've been discussing. Um, this pattern is, I think, very much followed in Cambodia, in the Philippines, um, and, and certainly in Burma. Um, but you know, so you saw as this elite capture continued that many of the criminal networks were also very very quick to uh, take a posture politically that was very pro-PRC, very pro-Communist Party on a wide range of issues. So some of the different criminal networks that we've investigated, um, you know, for example, uh, Broken Tooth, the, the former head of the 14K cartel who is involved in these operations in all three countries that we've been looking at here in this panel, um, he has set up an association that was explicitly patriotic, explicitly meant to uh, organize overseas Chinese to adopt uh, a posture um, that was friendly to the Communist Party on issues like Taiwan, on human rights issues, um, on, on issues around Hong Kong, right? So um, you've seen Broken Tooth be able, in impunity, to advance these large-scale industrial criminal activities. The name of his zone in, in Myanmar is called the Dolmei Zone. Um, it's right on the Thai Myanmar border, and he's living in China. He's uh, posting things on Chinese social media on almost a daily basis. And it would seem that a lot of the illicit wealth is being filtered back into China. He He's been sanctioned, of course, by the US government. Um, and I think it's important to look at you know, steps that can be taken, like sanctions, to deal with some of these activities. But I think it highlights one of the ways in which these, these networks are, are operating. Of course, the other um, side of this is that China has continued uh, something of uh, a crackdown. But you're not really seeing the crackdown target um, many of these high-level players. There are a few exceptions, uh, but most of these higher-level players in these networks are pr protected by local elites or have very close contacts to the United Front or to other aspects of um, the Chinese government or quasi-governmental associations. Um, and so I think that that makes Chinese efforts efforts to crack down on them, both extremely difficult and in some cases really even against uh, China's broader, broader uh, interests. Um, lastly, I think the other thing that the Chinese response has done is that it's targeted a lot of the foot soldiers that are you know, occupying this, this industry, um, targeting you know, the ability of Chinese to travel to other countries, for example, or uh, targeting freedoms of Chinese to go across borders maybe for otherwise uh, legitimate uh, purposes. But what it's also done is cost, uh, played a role in the shift of some of the patterns with these networks now focusing more on uh, an international population rather than on a Chinese population because it's harder to get a hold of Chinese labor as a result of some of these trends. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add, uh, not much to add on the direct uh, relationship, but certainly the impact that you're suggesting, a massive amount of revenue and the destabilizing of governance and democracy in these countries is absolutely the, the end result of that. And regardless of where that's coming from, that's extremely concerning. These are, this is a proven model at this point. Yes, it's, it's, it's a PRC originating dominant criminal industry, but in Cambodia, there's also significant evidence of uh, Thai criminal gangs, uh, Taiwanese-based, um, Vietnamese-based. And so they have a model that they're working from. It's proven to be highly lucrative, extremely straightforward to run and operate with high profit margins, even in extremely unstable contexts like Myanmar. And so when you do see uh, what is effective seeding of sovereignty across the region to opaque criminal groups, that's something for concern, uh, regardless of where those groups' uh, loyalties lie. Oh, um, so as an academic, I will, I will argue that we don't have enough data to, base, to, to answer this directly, right? Uh, I will tell you, however, um, the data set we created on over two to 300 companies go, that went to the Philippines, you can actually find, um, I would say, 60, 70% of them have 
Chinese investors in them, like PRC citizen investors. Even the ones in the Cayman Islands, you don't see the investors, but you see the managers. And you see the managers, by and large, are like Chinese citizens. With a significant amount of money, that means they have economic capacity in China to invest in countries like the Philippines. And that means political ties as well, et cetera. That said, it's really hard to say. You find a bit of both. You find uh, the Chinese government criminalizing uh, you know, groups and low-level like actors. On the, one, on the other, you find them, like I would say, supporting or even like condoning some of the activities. Even the Philippine case is complicated. I mean, Jack Lam was a Ma Macauan-based Chinese, like, uh, I don't know what this is, um, gambler or capitalist, right? Michael Yang was also like, uh, you know, was also like another like capitalist. But they, uh, you know, um, Michael Yang seems to have strong ties, with, strong ties with the Fujian government. And up until now, he's fine. And Jack Lam is now on the run somewhere. Um, but that being said, a response to this should not be aimed at China, per se. It would be better, particularly if you think it, that it has political implications for democracies, it would be better for democracies, the leadership of democracies, to join forces in a, as the TIP report says, in a strategic multi-dimensional partnership with um, civil, civil society, uh, law enforcement, international organizations, governments, uh, to put together a strategy for protecting democracies against this kind of, um, well, disease, I suppose, um, and just cutting it off preventive rather than trying to place the blame on one country or another, um, except for the countries that are hosting it. Do we have time? We, we have a couple minutes left, so maybe time for one more. Sure. Um, perhaps for our audience who is less familiar with this phenomenon, um, could you explain what the pig butchering scam is? Um, and what are your best estimates for how many cybercrime compounds there are in each of the countries you've spoken about? Uh, maybe just very uh, quickly on the pig butchering scam. Um, it's, it's basically, it could be romance-based, but it's uh, basically it starts with an anonymous message on, on WhatsApp. Someone reaches out and says, hi, someone, there's one case where it was uh, someone sent a message to another person uh, asking when his piano was going to be delivered. Usually the persons receiving these messages have been targeted using some form of AI. Um, so they're looking for particular vulnerable populations. And what happens in these scams is that for maybe one or two months, um, the, the perpetrator, who again, the perpetrator may also be a victim in many of these cases because they're in, being held in one of these forced labor compounds, but um, the perpetrator will send you know, series of messages, building trust with the person, establishing in a, a romantic relationship with the person. And once that trust is established, um, you'll see them introduce some type of investment opportunity, maybe even linked to some kind of a shared future that maybe the perpetrator aims to have with uh, the victim. And um, why it's called pig butchering is because you kind of are then at that point beginning to fatten up the, the victim. The victim puts money into that, sees an instant return, puts more money in, now has both maybe a very close trusting relationship with the perpetrator. And it continues up until the point where the perpetrator has detected that more or less this person is in for their net worth or for the maximum amount that they're able to defraud. And then whatever platform it is, whether it's a crypto platform or some other form of online investment scheme is taken down, the wealth disappears, and the victim is really butchered on two levels. The emotional psychological level of someone who they deeply trusted, maybe had a romantic relationship with, um, harming them. And then on another level, of course, the financial loss. So that, I think, uh, briefly is, is um, the the pig butchering scam. In terms of Myanmar, the number of these types of large-scale enclaves, um, there's at least 35 of them spread across um, Karen State, uh, Shan State, and Kachin State. Uh, but again, there are also many smaller compounds where this form of activity is taking in other parts of the country. Um, so I think, again, looking at um, the research that is necessary, right? This is something that's evolving on a day-to-day on a -day basis with more and more um, I think uh, scam networks and syndicates moving into this industry from uh, a growing number of, of sources. So um, I think it's something that warrants very careful and close uh, monitoring and analysis um, uh, in addition to, of course, a very strong response. 
Yeah, just very quickly in Cambodia, again, this is very difficult to assess, measure, estimate. Uh, IJM's dealt with uh, people who we believe to be victims coming out of several dozen of these compounds and through our work, several other organizations, public domain. Uh, there, there are certainly hundreds of compounds in Cambodia, uh, but that number is probably shifting uh, at any given time. Unlike in Myanmar where these compounds are existing um, in sort of contested, fragmented areas of, uh, areas of fragmented sovereignty, or in Laos uh, where they're occurring predominantly in special economic zones, uh, this space in Cambodia is actually defined uh, differently uh, that they are everywhere. Uh, they're uh, in apartment buildings, some, yes, purpose-built, uh, but some actually just repurposed apartment buildings, uh, hotels, casinos all over the country. Uh, there were several uh, within a two-block radius of, of my home in Phnom Penh. Um, and so the, the number is shifting constantly, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very uh, in the water, uh, so to speak. Oh, in the Philippines in 2019, at the height of it, it was 314. Uh, but that's an un that's um, under uh, that's an under uh, under uh, underestimating the numbers because the way many of this this firms work is they do have one big company and they host tens and dozens and hundreds of like micro gaming companies inside the company. So there's, there, that's like a more complicated structure. Right now in 2022, since the Marcos government, um, it's now down to, down to 34. So officially, at least. So <laughs> hard to say for real. Thank you. Well, I think we've reached our time limit now, and I'd like to thank all of the wonderful participants, Ambassador Dyer, Jason, um, <clears throat> Jacob, and, and Alvin. It's been very, very rewarding today to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you.